Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. 1113 transmission assembly starts now. But first, just a little bit of housekeeping. I've had the uh, last couple videos in the comment section, people have noticed those two starting engine blocks and people have noticed those two starting engine blocks and I get the same question over and over again. Are those the ones that were at the machine shop? And unfortunately, no. Remember, I disassembled six or seven of them to get the, yeah, I think seven of them total. One block was junk and made its way down to the scrap pile. Four others are in here. And then we had the two that I sent to the machine shop, which are still there. So as I move things around in here, some of these pony blocks become visible where they weren't visible before. And then, you know, they get noticed and then no. So yeah, all that stuff's at the machine shop yet. Um, that type of work is not their bread and butter. And I've explained this in the comments section several times over. They do a lot of automotive stuff. That's their primary function. And even the dealer where I work uses them for all of our cylinder heads, all of our engine block problems. The trouble is, knowing the atmosphere in automotive repair facilities, they want everything turned around instantly. They do excellent work, but the resto guys like me are not the ones that take priority. So sometimes pieces are there for a long, long time. I get it because I have a foot in both of those worlds. So, and quality wise, they're the only ones that I would allow to do that type of work anyway. So it's it's gonna take as long as it takes. But yeah, those uh, apparently those blocks, or unfortunately I should say, those blocks and those blocks have been sitting where they're at for a long time. So no, when I get pony parts back from the machine shop, I will make a video immediately. You guys will be the first to know. So back to 1113 transmission. So what we're going to do today is get the bevel gear hub and shaft assembled in to that case. Those are the first pieces that have to go back in. Yeah, you can see we have some new bearings and races here for the bevel shaft right from CAT. We should be able to get everything fixed back up right there. First order of business, I have to get this bearing off of the shaft and I also have to get, take that guy out of there, these two races out of these two caps. So let's just get to it. Okay, so this is my setup for the first attempt at pulling this bearing from the shaft. These are a fairly tight press fit and the way I have the puller behind the cage and rollers is guaranteed to destroy this bearing. That's okay because it's matched with this race that started losing chunks out of the face. So neither one of those pieces were gonna be salvaged anyway. So reason for the setup as I have it, these first generation shafts run the taper right up tight against the lip on that inner race. You can't get the bearing splitter enough of a purchase on that to apply the pressure where needed to push that off and still be able to save the bearing. The later shafts have a little bit of a relief cut around there. You can just hook that inner race, start some movement, and then get a better uh, purchase on it and then push it the rest of the way off. But it's all right. Um, well, we're likely just to peel the cage and the rollers off of the inner race anyway with this. And at that point, I can try and split the inner race and, and pop that off. But to do that, you need to have the cage and rollers off anyway. So we might as well try this first and see if we get lucky. So take it to the press. Oh, come on. Oh yeah, I think we're gonna make it. I'll watch that cage splay out a little bit, but it's holding. That just made my day a little bit easier. Don't say that out loud, Scott. You're gonna jinx it. There we go. Stop bolt. <laughs> Okay, the bevel shaft is ready for final cleanup now that we have the bearing off. Next, I need to get the races out of these caps. You can see I have a rather involved looking puller set up assembled onto the first one already, but it's pretty much a direct copy of what they show in the service manual for pulling those races. Heavy beam style OTC puller with the push feet on it, ready to exert down pressure on the cap on this heavy duty portion here. You don't wanna go down on the flange because that's not strong enough. Then I have this jaw puller inside beneath the race prepared to pull up. Okay. 
Okay, so easy enough with all the proper puller tools. Let's pretend we don't have those tools. And this race is going to be a perfect one to use as an example anyhow because it's the one that was shelling pieces out of the face. So it's already junk. An old mechanics trick is to lay a bead of weld around the inside face of a bearing race. And because hot metal contracts as it cools, that hot bead of weld when it cools will actually shrink the OD of that race a little bit and sometimes so much so that you could just tip that up and it would fall right out. Other times it becomes, well most times it just becomes a lot more manageable to pull that. Problem is that destroys the race. There's no, there's no going back after you've done that but since this one's junk anyway, let's have some fun. Okay, so I let it cool off outside for about 30 minutes. Let's just see what happens. Yep, look at that. <laughs> it's that easy. It's amazing how that weld will actually shrink that race. But I I laid kind of a heavy bead on there, but then again, it's kind of a heavy race, you know. So, yeah, you'll never get anything to roll on that ever again, but that's the easy way to take bearing races out, let me tell you. So... We'll clean all this stuff up now. Okay, time to look at the new parts. So, brand new cat bearings here. We have the 1B3890 cone and the 1B3891 cup. Here's what we have though. I was kind of curious to see whose bearings were going to be in those boxes. This is an NTN bearing and we have a 4T-438 on that one, also in NTN race, we have a 4T-432. So it was a lot like I suspected. Well, I'm not really surprised. I'm a bit disappointed, but I'm not really surprised. The problem is modern bearings are not what the Timkins of yesteryear were. In fact, the Timkins of today aren't what the Timkins of yesteryear were. I'll tell you what, guys. Those are pretty standard numbers. Take the uh, 438 number off of that cone and the 432 number off of that cup. Take them to your local bearing supplier. Have them run those numbers. You'll get those same quality bearings for a lot cheaper than what I paid to get them in these uh, these nice looking yellow boxes. Well, that's fortunately that's what it is. So, I mean, they're still not. I mean, they're going to be they're going to outlast the rest of 1113. They're definitely definitely going to outlast me. So. We're not worried about that, but we're going to have to adjust the preload specs on those a little bit to come more in line with what my experience in the auto industry is. Anyhow, we're going to cross that bridge when we get there. So, well, it's time to press the races into the caps, and it's time to press this bearing onto the shaft. So, the best tool for installing that bearing, here's what I did. I split the cage and took the rollers off of the, uh, the one that I'd already distorted that I pressed off. And yeah, good call on the new bearings. That inner race was even more chewed than the outer race was. So definitely shot. But this is your best installing tool you could ever have for pressing the new bearing on. It's going to fit the inside of the race just like that. We're going to keep all the tension off of the cage and the rollers. And it's already going to be a perfect fit onto the shaft. So once again to the press. Okay, once again, we'll get the disc out of the way. Use the old race as a driver to press the new one in place. Okay, both bearing caps have the new races pressed in. So 
We're at the point where we can finally start putting things together. One thing I should touch on though first, you'll notice I left the old oil seals in the caps. And the reason being, those old double-lipped leather seals will go a long way towards supporting the bevel shaft while we're doing our work back there in the case. It really helps to keep the new bearings from getting knocked around too badly. So we're best off leaving those right where they're at for now. We are gonna be replacing those, but for the time being, we'll use them to our advantage. So first step, pop the bevel gear into the casting. Okay, right here is where you want to be doubly sure you've got this bevel gear put in correctly because you could flop it and have the bevel gear towards this side with the hub sticking out the other way. That would result in a machine that has five reverse speeds and one forward because you'd be on the wrong side of the pinion and it would turn everything out through the final drives opposite of what it should be. So make sure you get this positioned correctly. It can go either way. But if you put it in wrong, it's going to be a really bad day the first time you go to drive it. All right, we'll slide the bevel shaft through the hub of the gear now. We've got the key in place on the shaft. We just make sure to line it up with the hub of the gear. Working from the other side now, we'll put the bearing cap on that has that old leather seal in it yet, so it'll help us support this into the shaft. We'll just loosely install a couple of nuts on there just to keep it all in place. All right, we're ready to press that bevel gear onto the shaft. We're gonna use the hollow ram again. And I pretty much have the same setup that's listed in the service manual. You can see we just have the hollow ram here, long bolt that grabs onto the end of the bevel shaft. And pretty much the only non-cat tool here is number three, which is a nine inch piece of two and a quarter ID tube, or in my case, heavy wall pipe. Hence the D2 bevel gear words that are on there. So that's going to surround the shaft. Press on the hub, just like you see here. So the hollow ram is going to be pulling the shaft. The heavy wall pipe is going to be pushing the hub. And we're basically going to expand that thing onto that taper. Spec is to press the bevel gear hub on the shaft using 12 tons pressure. So this is where the OTC pressure and tonnage gauge comes into play. You can see it's made for three different sizes of ram, 17 and a half ton, 30 ton, and 50 ton. We have the 17 and a half, so we will be using the inside scale built off of a 10,000 PSI working range, and you have tonnage in the quadrants so that we will just, well, we don't really have to look at pressure so much as just watch the needle come around when it hits 12 on that inside scale. We know we've gone far enough. You do have the red danger zone before it maxes out at 15,000. These rams are only meant to really operate at 10. You probably have a little bit of wiggle room, but you don't want to push it much further than that. And these are some pretty nice gauges, really. And in addition to the triple scale, there's also an auditory warning. If that needle hits the red zone, it'll start playing Kenny Loggins music. So in case you're out of visual range, it gives you an auditory warning to come over here, goose the release lever, and dump the pressure before you get dangerous. All right, so we've got the heavy wall pipe up against the hub and the hollow rams latched onto the shaft. So we just start dialing up some pressure. Watch that needle. Okay, we're about 10 and a half. And honestly, we're right about 12 right there. So tension on that, don't stand in front of it. Liking that, so we'll just dump pressure. 
there we are not dangerous anymore all right we want to take a look in here now and we can see that the hub is still standing out proud of the beginning of the taper on the shaft so that means our press fit is good if we were well if we had taper of the shaft sticking out beyond the face of the hub then components are worn most likely the hub and we'd be out of luck until we could find another one but this one is still good so and keyway looks like it's got good engagement too so next we throw the fold over lock and nut on there this is what the new fold over locks are um, only the early early ones had the little tab that engaged with the keyway that you can see on the original there later ones went a little larger outside diameter and they got rid of that tab but they still serve the same purpose so position that on there and start the nut so we'll try and do this one handed hold the camera and talk at the same time when you press or when you install these uh yeah this is working great <clears throat> let me get more comfortable all right this is live folks so anyway when you press these hubs on to you know i'm really trying here guys <laughs> let's get this started there we are so when you actually you know in a calibrated manner press these hubs onto these shafts the nut doesn't have to be run down all that tight because what we just did with the hollow ram is what properly seats the bevel gear onto the shaft at this point the nut just kind of has to be i won't say snugged up it has to still it still has to be tight but you don't have to just go ridiculous on it because the nut is only there to prevent that shaft from moving you know we're already as tight as we need to be on the taper so we'll just cinch that up real quick okay put the other bearing cap on like i said to stabilize the shaft we're about to put some torque on it and same holding fixture as before to keep everything from turning if you guys watched me take all this apart you're familiar with how this works by now all we need okay I've removed the holding tools from this side I've pulled this bearing cap off again and I've slid the entire bevel gear and shaft out to get at the fold over lock so we've got that secured as I roll it around what you want to do is utilize the raised portion of the hub right above the keyway slot to fold the lock onto and take advantage of that square shoulder right there, square corner. That's going to ensure no counterclockwise rotation can happen at all. So once I had that in place, 180 off, I just utilized one of the flats on the nut, folded the lock down tight to that. So we're secure. Now, if you didn't have the fancy pressing tools to install that, all this stuff like we use to press that um, hub onto the shaft, the manual does also say the bevel gear hub can also be pulled in place using a wrench on nut. If a wrench is used, it is necessary to use a torque of 700 to 750 pound feet to pull the gear in place. Use a four foot pipe extension on the wrench. <laughs> okay, so yeah, kind of like that, but I'll guarantee they're not using an adjustable wrench like mine to achieve 700 to 750 pound feet. I bet that tops out, out at about probably 250 and it's getting ready to spread. So anyway, if you have the wrench to do it, you do not need hydraulics. But we're at the point now, we need to press the new left side bearing on until it bottoms out. We're going to use the hollow ram for that again. Pretty much same setup as installing the hub, except I have a smaller piece of pipe that's just made for pushing the bearing on. I have D2 bevel bearing stamped in there. When I stamp these, I'm less likely to uh, hack them up for something else so same arrangement as before i'll use that old bearing race as a driver on the new one piece of pipe goes on to that hollow ram pushes it on
Okay, everybody. There we are. Bevel, gear, and shaft are installed. Bearings are in place. We're going to call it for this episode. The next episode, we're going to pick right back up, start setting preload for those new bearings. That's quite an involved process, and it's considering the fact that we're using a completely different gear set and new bearings, I'm expecting all of those old shim packs to have to be reset. It's probably going to get a little bit involved, so I think we're just best off cutting the video right here. Thanks for watching, everybody. I appreciate everybody being here. As you know, the channel's been growing. We have memberships available now. There should be a join box down by the subscribe box below the video. Click on that, see if it's something you want to do. Just a reminder, perks of membership, additional behind the scenes footage, and all new content debuts on the members page for about 24 hours, about a day, ad free before it goes public. So we're gonna keep rolling with 1113 here. Thanks for the views, thanks for being around, thanks for supporting the channel, you guys are all awesome. Hope to see you back again.